uh, presented by the National Female Condom Coalition. Uh, my name is Sarah Samelka, um, and I'm part of the coalition. And um, we are going to get started here in a couple of minutes. Um, again, so this is the webinar called Breaking Regulatory Barriers for Greater Female Condom Access. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and go in. I have about 10.03. So I just want to say a special thank you to our sponsoring partners today. Um, we have a lot of people that have helped us uh, with the webinar. So we have the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, AVAC, the California Family Health Council, the Center for Health and Gender Equity, Conrad, uh, the International Rectal Microbicides Advocates, uh, MATCH Research, the National Women's Health Network, PATH, and uh, UAFC Joint Program have all kind of helped us today with uh, put together our webinar. We want to thank all of our sponsoring partners for that. And I'm also just going to go through a couple of uh, slides about the National Female Kind of Coalition to get everyone a bit more familiar with us, um, if you aren't already. So again, we are a partnership of U.S. and U.S.-based advocates, researchers, health departments, community-based and national organizations. Um, and our mission is to increase awareness, acceptance, access, and use of female condoms. Um, we do this through um, several different avenues, um, education, advocacy, and collaboration with other organizations and municipalities throughout the U.S. Um, we'd love for you to check us out on the web and learn more about us at nationalfccoalition.org. Um, and also we have a Facebook page, Nash, which is just Facebook, and then it's National FC Coalition. So please like us and check us out, and um, you can find out more about us and our work. And just again, a little bit more about what we do. We have a coordinated national advocacy agenda. Um, so what we work for is the full integration of female condoms into sexual health, HIV prevention, and family planning programs. Um, we work to um, increase the programming and policies to scale up female condom awareness throughout the country. And we also support research development and introduction of safe and effective receptive partner initiated condoms uh, for people of all genders and who engage in both um, vaginal and anal receptive sex. So that's part of what we do. Um, just a couple of um, things we've been working on recently. Are, uh, we work with the CDC Division of HIV and AIDS Prevention and also the FDA's Office of Women's Health to update their online communications about FCs to reflect the latest data. So we just try to make sure that when organizations put information out on the web that it's the latest and most accurate info. We also have a partnership with several um, national organizations, including the National Coalition of STD Directors, also UCHAPS and NASTAD, which are some other national organizations. And we have a campaign to ensure that health departments are putting out accurate information about female condoms um, on their websites and include them in their prevention information. So there's a couple of like kind of national campaigns that we've been working on lately, and that's the type of work that we do. So that's a little bit about us, um, and really we'll get to our presentation very quickly. I just have a few tech tips for you today. Um, everyone is in listen-only mode, so everyone is muted, all of our participants, um, but you can ask questions throughout the webinar by using the questions feature. Um, so you can type questions to us, and we'll be receiving those throughout the webinar, and when we take Q&A breaks, um, I and some other of my colleagues will be moderating, and we can ask your questions to the panelists, and they will be able to answer for you. Um, and also, if you're, you can also send us a question if you're having trouble seeing or hearing the webinar. But a couple of tips for seeing and hearing. Um, if you want to listen in, you can use your computer speakers or plug your headphones into your computer to hear the presentation. If that's not working for you, um, you can also use a telephone to dial in, and you can do that by clicking on the audio tab and then just follow the instructions with the dial in number and the access code, and you can listen through your telephone. Also, if you're having any issues seeing the webinar, um, you can also download our slides, which is the nationalfccoalition.org slash webinar, and we posted the slides there so you can follow along if you're having any trouble seeing it. So yeah, I just want to give you a quick introduction to today's speakers, and I'll turn it over to our great panel of experts. Um, so we have Mag Vexinka from Max Research, who will be talking about uh, female condoms and reviewing the products currently available in development. We'll also have Saskia Huskin speaking, um, talking about the impact of the regulatory improvements for on-the-ground programming of female condom products. Then we'll have Coco Jervis talking about the uh, just FDA approval of female condoms, kind of where we've been. And then um, Jessica Terlikowski will be talking about paving the way for more female condom options in the future. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mag, um, who will kind of kick off our presentation today. 
Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm Max Pekzinska from Match Research and we're an organisation in South Africa uh, linked to the University of the Witwatersrand and um, we do sexual and reproductive health research and, but a lot of our focus is on barrier method research, in particular the female condom. So I've got three parts to this webinar. I'm going to talk about products that are available and are sort of coming through in development. I'm going to then talk a little bit about the research that is being done to get them um, made more available. And finally, I'm going to just touch on the class of the device that female condoms are in and male condoms, just to look at the sort of history um, before we move into um, the FDA portion. So next slide, please. Okay, so why are new female products being developed? So there's many um, issues and reasons they're being developed. Um, we all want a bit of choice and we want to keep down costs. Um, there has been a great interest in um, developing new female condoms recently by male female condom manufacturers and new manufacturers. Um, there are many different male condoms, many different barrier methods and other hormonal contraceptives. So, um, but there's also an issue of, you know, if you introduce small female condoms, which is a much smaller market, is that going to um, be negative for the market as a whole? But that's a whole different debate. So if I can go on to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so this is by no means an exhaustive um, uh, list of what female condoms are available now, but I'm just going to touch on each one slightly and also show you the packaging for each one if it's available, um, because I think female condom manufacturers have really come to the party and, and are producing really nice packaging, um, attractive packaging to make the product more attractive for people to, to use. Um, and also, I'll talk a bit about, um, though they're called female condoms, some of the new female condoms coming up are um, known as internal condoms because they can be used for anal sex. Um, obviously, some female condoms are used for anal sex, but this is, these are specifically being designed for anal sex. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go on to the, start talking about the individual condoms. Um, FC2 female condom, which we all know very well, and I'm just showing you two examples of packaging here as well. Um, that are available in South Africa, for instance, where we have a large program. So we've got the purple packet top left, which is in the public sector. And we've also got a lovely um, designed packaging, um, which is in the social marketing uh, sector, which kicked off at the beginning of last year. So FC2 widely available, approved by FDA, WHO, and this replaced FC1 um, in 2009. If I can have the next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to talk about the women's condom now, which is also known as the V condom, if you look at the top, the packaging there, and there's some um, marketing studies um, ongoing in South Africa at the moment, and some of these will be presented at the SAAIDS conference next week. So a very interesting package which opens up, which has a lubricant inside. Um, the women's condom has got um, a capsule which dissolves when you insert it. And it's not been pre-qualified yet, but there's a lot of research that has been done on the women's condom, which I'll talk about later. And it's the polyurethane female condom. I have the next slide, please. Which is a Cupid and Cupid 2. So Cupid and Cupid 2 is the same design, one slightly smaller and um, the body of the condom is shorter and thinner than the other. But the Cupid condom, which is on the top left, is the one that has actually been approved recently by WHO. Um, it's got a medical grade sponge in the bottom for insertion and a outer frame that's octag octagonal. And you can see the packaging on the left, which is a sort of, a, you can't see it very well, the color is a pinky purple packaging. Um, and it's available in, in quite a few countries now, including South Africa. Um, next slide, please. The Funes female condom, which is a bit like FC2, but it's sort of dumbbell shaped. It's got a ring in the bottom and an external ring and some packaging there. It's available in China where it's approved. It's polyurethane and it has this um, stick which actually folds in two in the packet, which opens up, which can be used for insertion, um, but it doesn't need to be used. It can be used just with the ring. Um, it hasn't been pre-qualified yet, so it's not widely available outside of China. Okay, if we can move on to the next one. 
These are two very interesting designs, both made by Inova Panty, um, Inova Columbia. They're made of um, polyethylene. One is a very interesting design. It's just a bubble of air, which is used for insertion. And then the end sort of unknots to form an outer um, area, but it hasn't got anything like a ring. It's just sort of got like a loose outside area and it's called the air female condom. Then we've got the panty condom, which many people have actually seen, and there's, you can just about see the packaging there. And then in the bottom picture with the black background, you can see um, the condom inserted, and on the right side is the refill. And essentially this is a male condom manufacturer, and the condom refill and the condom in the panty is actually their male condom. So they've just adapted it, and we've recently done some research on this condom, which I'll mention later. So if I can have the next slide. Do stop me if I'm going too quickly. <laughs> okay, the Pleasure More Female condom, also very similar to, to FC2. So there are many condoms coming through which are sort of slight variants on, on the outer ring and the inner ring. Um, this has been available in South Africa, in, in sort of pockets of South Africa, but is not widely available, and that's the packaging that we have um, in South Africa, and it's not yet pre-qualified by WHO, UNFPA, but essentially it's 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 fairly almost fairly identical to FC2. Okay, next one, please. Um, this is the Ready or VMO or VA Wow, as it's more recently known. This condom's had quite a checkered history. It's been around for a long time, um, many many years ago, and it's changed not so much in design but in length, so now it's a very short length, it's 90 centimetres, and then it's got quite a large sort of sort of solid medical grade sponge in the bottom. And it was sold by Ready to, um, it was originally made by Medtech, it was sold in um, uh, India and other African countries. And now I see that it's, it, it's now under licence to a company in Michigan which seem to be selling it as a vibrating female condom. So you see adverts on the internet for this as this orgasm giving vibrating condom um, but it's not yet pre-qualified and I haven't actually seen how it works with this vibrating component um, and there's the packaging of it there. So next slide. The origami female condom which I didn't include in my first slide and in fact this the name of, of this condom has changed to the internal condom because it's going to be um, something that's used for vaginal or anal sex. So there's a couple of pictures on it of it here, but I think the design has been tweaked. Um, and this design has got a concertina opening, um, and the sort of concertina shape is used for insertion. So instead of having a, a ring or a capsule or a sponge to insert, the concertina shape actually aids um, insertion. Okay, the next one. It's quite a few to get through. We're almost there. The Velvet Female Condom, um, HLL Life Care are um, an experienced condom manufacturer and they've moved into the female condom market um, with also another condom with a outer ring, inner ring, similar to FC2 but if you look at the body of the condom it's slightly wider, um, it's made of latex, um, whereas FC2 is synthetic latex and also Cupid is made of um, latex so many female condoms are now moving to latex to try and reduce the material costs. And this, um, most of these female condoms are actually in the process of um, getting their uh, regulatory issues in order and applying for WHO, UNFPA pre-qualification, so they're in that process. So next is the and next section. Yeah, and sorry, Mag, um, we're just gonna take a quick break for some questions. We've had some questions come in, if that's okay. okay. Um, we had someone ask us if you could explain a little bit more about what pre-qualified means. Um, that phrase came up a couple of times. Okay. Um, the pre-qualification system is the same for many um, devices and drugs with WH and UNFPA. So they pre-qualify products and then they sort of like ensure they're safe. So when you have a pre-qualification system, you have to go through various, um, you know, product testing, manufacturing, and UNFPA, WHO actually review all your information, your dossiers on the way you manufacture your products, what you're manufacturing, where your materials come from, all the testing that you have to do, the voluntary testing, safety testing. 
and then once they've sent out inspectors to um, to the factories that make the drugs or the barrier methods or the condoms and they are satisfied that you are making them to the correct processes and safety procedures you will be pre-qualified which means that they include you on a on essentially a list which is then available to uh, maybe donors want to um, buy male or female condoms and then donate them to a country so they will actually many of them like USA will only buy um, and other donors only by pre-qualified male and female condoms. Great, thanks so much. So and then we the actually... UNF... Sorry, oh. if you go onto the UNFPA website, you can see what products have been pre-qualified. So you can see which female condoms, which male condoms have been pre-qualified. Great, thank you. That, thank you for going into that in a little bit more detail. And then we also had a couple questions. People are curious about the panty condom. I don't know if you have any other things to say, but people are interested more just in the, the features of it or, or exactly how it works. I don't know if you have any more information yes, I about it. We want to go back for that. It's actually um, a, a device that was sort of available more in um, sex stores and uh, as a novelty item. So people, they're quite expensive. So you would buy one in a packet which came with a panty and then you would get two refills. So you would actually use the, um, if you look at it, it's a bit like a panty liner. You put it in the crutch of the panty which has a, a sort of split in it and then the condom is actually opens up. So it hasn't got a sort of external ring. Uh, what's actually holding the, the condom um, from going inside is the panty itself and then you just it's pushed inside with the penis and then the condom can be removed the panty can be washed so we've recently um, done a bit of work on this and it's because it's so expensive they're not really they would like to move into a wider market and women and men seem to really like it but it's obviously never going to um, be a low-cost product so when we've been looking at it it has it's the issue of the adhesion to the panty during sex could possibly be a problem. Um, so, but otherwise, it's you know it's quite a popular. In, in the research we've done, it's been very popular. Great, thank you. Um, and we have another question that came in about the Cupid and the Ready condoms, um, the one that have um, the sponges to hold it in place. Um, okay. And so, so that's obviously um, the different than you know some options have the rings and these have sponges. Um, I know that those help with insertion, um, but then do they just remain inside the whole time or yes, do they get taken back out? Do. Can you talk a little about the sponge aspect? Yeah, they, I mean, main, they're supposed to remain inside, but they don't need to. And for instance, with um, the FC2, which has been around for a long time, when it's used for anal sex, for instance, um, it, the ring is usually removed. So some women find the um, the sponge and the ring actually makes sex more pleasurable, whereas some people actually find it uncomfortable and they will insert the condom and then remove the sponge. So the sponge is really there. Once it's inserted, um, the female condom tends to stay in place, so it can be taken out. So they are actually loose. They're, fi they're not fixed um, in any way. So it's really a preference issue, but the, ad the advice on all the packaging is to leave the rings and the sponges inside. Great, and just a quick follow-up to that um, in terms of the sponges. Um, do, are they compatible with someone who has an IUD uh, for birth control? And also, are they, do you know if they're compatible with different types of lubricant? Um, it depends on the material of the condom because, for instance, Cupid is latex. Um, some of them polyurethane, which obviously can take any lubricant. Um, you've got synthetic latex, which is also you can use many lubricants. But once you've got latex, you have the same problem as a male condom. You know, it, they, it can be destroyed by using, you know, the wrong lubricant. So most female, most female condoms actually come pre-lubricated. And with the FC2, for instance, some people are quite happy or think there's, you know, plenty enough lubrication. So. Um, with the PATH women's condom, um, there is a lubricant in the package so people can just add as much as they want on the inside and the outside. But looking at them, most people feel that they're adequately lubricated. Great. Thank you. And I'm, we're just going to take one more question. We've been having a lot of questions come in and just to let people know, keep sending them and we'll have future question breaks. Well, I'll mention this, but just one more question. Um, and this is about the origami female condom. Um, just wondering if 
could describe, the question was, could you describe a little bit more about it, particularly does the applicator um, expand after insertion, and is there a reason that it is being reworked? Um, or just, um, if you could just talk a little bit more about the origami. Piece. Well, I think the, um, the I'm, a, I'm in quite a difficult position because I work with lots of manufacturers and I can't really go into much detail about their products if they're in the development stage. So what I'm Got showing it. you what is out there on the internet, what, what is, you know, they've been in study, so people know. Uh, the rest is, you know, there's manufacturers I'm working with who are developing condoms who I can't really discuss. But um, the, I know Army on its website has got a male condom and it's now, and it's got an internal condom. It's got no longer got a female condom. Um, and I think that's just the name change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And like I said, um, if people want to keep sending in questions, that's great. We're going to move on to Mags's next section, but we'll have future question breaks. So um, take it away, Mags. Okay, so I'm just going to do a very brief section on the research that many of these female condoms have been in. And um, you can go on to the next slide. And I didn't speak to them individually when I showed you the individual condoms because um, you can go on to the next, as with economies of scale, um, with these functionality trials that have to be done for regulatory purposes, you can actually get several into several different designs into one study, which makes it more cost effective because many manufacturers um, actually can't afford to do all this clinical work. Um, and we'll discuss later exactly why. So, you know, actually producing a new design involves huge amounts of work, commitment, years of work to get through the pre qualification system. Um, and you have to do a lot of clinical work to show that they work correctly. Um, and in all these studies, you have to use um, a device that has already been approved. So the FC2 is always used as the one device that has already been approved. So in this um, particular study, we had the women's condom, we had Cupid, um, and we had the um, VA Wow. All in one study, women were randomized to use each one. So each woman used five of each of these types. And it, this, this was the sort of study that's required by um, WHO, and FPA. Um, and it was done in two countries. And then some, it was, the report was sent to UNFPA. And since this time, um, Cupid has been pre-qualified. So if we go on to the next study. So this is a very similar study done, also done by Match Research. Um, where we've got the velvet female condom, we've got the smaller cupid, and we've got FC2, which is the control, which always goes in as the comparison. Um, and in both of these studies, the, the female condoms worked as well as, as FC2. Um, and basically, though they have got their differences, they, they are working in the same way. You know, you need someone, something on the outside to keep the condom outside. You need something to insert. Um, less so maybe to keep the condom inside because the force of sex keeps it inside. Um, and you need it a certain length, you know, to, to make sure it fits properly. Okay, so these reports that the studies are sent to WHO, UNFPA, um, to assist the manufacturers with their pre-qualification process. So next slide. Um, so there was some work done on the origami internal condom, um, and it was funded by I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and this is the new internal condom, which we're going to start the study quite soon. So it's a very small pilot study, um, and it will, it will be done with male couples and also heterosexual couples, but they're actually going to be using exactly the same um, condom, and uh, the 12 couples will use it for vaginal sex, and the 12 um, male couples will use it for anal intercourse. So hopefully that will start soon and be finished um, well before the end of the year. Okay, next slide. Um, and this, sorry, this is the previous work that's been done, which was done in the US, um, where in fact the origami female condom is made. Um, and they use three different um, origami female condom products because origami is, has has actually been looking at very sort of different designs and developing a design to get to the one that they actually want to go forward with to a bigger study and then obviously to much wider um, distribution. Okay, next slide. And um, the women's condom, because um, we've mentioned it earlier in 
the first study, uh, they were in the first study, but they're doing, they've done a pregnancy and safety study because the women's condom is seen as quite different from FC2, um, and I'll talk about this later, is they decided to do a pregnancy study because for the FDA that they would want a pregnancy study done with a female condom that's significantly different in design from FC2. So that was finished in 2012, and I think the results will be out anytime soon. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, and this is another study that's been done in the US, um, which was comparing women's condom and FC2 using PSA as a biomarker of semen exposure. Um, and this is quite important because you know, it, it may replace doing pregnancy studies in the future. So being able to actually detect whether the condom was worked by looking at semen exposure after use. So this study was um, conducted with the California Family Health Council and, and Conrad, and the analysis is still continuing, I think. So next, next slide, please. Okay. And this is a, a failure mode study, um, the women's condom and FC2. And the secondary objective to that study was actually comparing the ability of WC and FC2 to prevent vaginal exposure to semen. And what's important about this study is that um, if PSA is an accurate measure of condom failure, Conrad and NICHD would encourage the US FDA to consider a shift in the type of data required for product approval based on this more accurate, less cost, costly method of determining product failure. And less costly means less costly than a large pregnancy trial. Okay, so I think we've moved on to the next slide already. So we're talking about now the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Grand Challenges, and I think they've had two rounds now, but they put out a, a grand challenge in saying develop um, a condom, male and female, that is better designed, is more pleasurable, um, people actually will want to use it. And so most of the funding awards have gone to male condoms, but some have included several, um, some have included female condom designs. And the winners of the award have been existing manufacturers, e.g. HLL, who make the velvet female condom, origami, and some new inventors. So some people have come in really at the prototype device, and some of these have been literally, they're still on paper. Um, but once they have the prototype device, they, the grants are available for, you know, prototype testing. And then if that is successful, then um, there's a further award of a much larger amount of money to actually do some clinical work uh, and go beyond the prototype. And obviously then look at, a, you know, a manufacturer coming on board and um, mass producing the, the condoms. So in particular, the award winners for the FC prototypes are looking at improved pleasure and sensation and they will go into larger trials when they're finalised. Okay, next slide, which is the next section. Okay. I don't know if there's any questions on the last section, um, but otherwise I'll go into the whole issue about male and female condoms as medical devices. So we can move straight on to the Sorry, next slide. Oh, yeah. really quick, sorry, this is Sarah, um, and we didn't have any more questions about the, the studies in particular, just had a few, up, a few more questions just about the female condom products in general, if we could, I'll just touch on those really quick. Um, okay. One person has asked um, if a female is using the Nuva ring for birth control, and then they want to use um, the FC2 condom or some of these other products, would this cause any complications, or how does that work? Um, I'm not sure about that, but I know in the microbicide trials, the ring trials, um, female condoms were, they, um, the participants were advised not to use them. But since that time, I think there has been some work done, um, and I think one of my colleagues that is on the webinar knows, will probably remember the abstract, which is looking at um, female condom use with, with rings. So I'm not actually, I, maybe someone else can answer that, but I'm not sure whether they would advise that they shouldn't be used with a ring. Yeah, my under, my understanding, Jessica, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, yeah. my understanding from that, that most recent study that was done is that you can use, it was looking just at the FC2 as far as I know, not at any of the other types of condom, the other types of female condoms, um, and the Nuva ring, and that, they, that, it, was, that it was okay to use. Um, 
but I don't have like any, I don't know the details around it or if there's intention on, or plans to use, to, to explore the, any of the other female condom options. Okay. Um, and, and Jessica, I had a quick question, just like a follow-up, um, that um, it's advisable, if this is correct, advisable if you do want to use the, if you have NuvaRing as your birth control and you still do want to use the FC2, can you take out the NuvaRing while you, in, when you insert the FC2 and then put it back in? So technically you can, you can take mm -hmm. out the NuvaRing um, mm -hmm. if you have somebody who's also really committed to putting it back in um, and mm -hmm. keeping in mind that it's, you know, that it does need to be, be worn regularly um, or consistently right. rather. One thing I also, I do want to go back to the point about the, the, the recent data that did, that did come out from that microbicides trial is that there, there hasn't been any communication that I'm aware of as of yet from the female health company about indicating use of the FC2 and simultaneous use of the FC2 and the NuvaRing. Um, and okay. I'm not sure if there's intention for them, if they're planning on doing that, that or not. So perhaps if any of them are on the webinar, they might be able to weigh in through the uh, chat function for that. Okay, great. And then just one other quick question that we have, and this can be for any panelists too, um, but there, there was a question about when the design, any of the designs of female condoms, um, how long before sex can they be inserted? Um, and specifically, um, someone mentioned, can they be inserted eight hours before sex? Um, I know that that was um, something with the FC1. If anyone has any comments yeah. on that? Yeah, I know that the, the eight hours has been removed because there was some confusion and people thought, some people thought they had to insert it eight hours beforehand. So someone told someone told someone. So eventually it almost became a myth that oh, I can't use a female condom because I've got to insert it in the morning if I'm going to use it in the evening. Um, but also now I think with the um, the latex condom, female condoms becoming more available, is obviously latex is more likely to cause an allergy. Um, even, you know, there's very few people that have allergies to latex, but still. So you don't really want to put um, female condoms in much before you use them. I mean, you can put them in a couple of hours before if you want. Um, but I think with latex, it's probably advisable to to use them, you know, near the time you're having sex. But obviously, things like diaphragms are have been used before, so um, I don't think it's a problem. But I don't think it matters particularly. Great, thank you, and uh, we'll move on to the next section. Okay, you can move straight on to the, the next slide then, because I'm just going to talk briefly about female and med male condoms as medical devices. Um, and they're class medical devices as a whole. Um, from 1976, they were classified as one, two, or three, with one being the uh, lowest risk and three being the highest. And depending on the class, affects the regulatory controls, um, which ensure that they're safe and effective. Okay, so we can um, move on to the next slide. slide. So just talking about class one and class two devices, so these are just, just some examples. You know, class one is dental floss, bandages, sexual lubricants are split between class one and class two. It seems odd that a lubricant is called a device, but it is. Um, and most of most lubricants, you know, fall under the radar when, when it comes to, to the regulatory process. Class two, a bit more complex devices, cardiac monitors, male condoms are under class two and some lubricants. So 43% of medical devices fall under class two and 47 under class one. If we can go on to the next slide. And then we've got class three devices. So only 10% of medical devices fall under this category, the highest category. So um, they usually sustain or support life, um, implanted or unreasonable risk. So these, this is, female condoms are in the highest class of device. Next slide. So what, do, what are the controls for these devices? So class one are general controls. Um, they're exempt from 510K and at the bottom I explain what it is about the pre-market submission to FDA. Um, class two have special controls unless they're grandfathered, which is a funny term to use, but it's if they're marketed prior to 1976. Like, so devices like male condoms, diaphragms, 
having been around for years and years and years. So when they came in, they were generally given class two status. And class three, which includes the female condoms, they have general controls and they have to have this pre-market approval. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So how did male condoms get into class two? Uh, they were marketed and sold before the amendments of 1976 and were therefore grandfathered into this class. Um, and they're not exempt from um, 510k if they're significantly different or modified from um, an existing male condom that has been um, uh, approved. So next slide. Um, and all, almost all new condoms meet this substantially equivalent requirement um, and consequently most of them are approved um, because of this. Next slide. Which is talking about why female condoms are classified by uh, USFDA currently as class 3. When um, female condom first became available, which was FC1, it was a completely new product. And so there was really little history on safety. Um, you know, there was very little data, clinical data, long-term safety data. And also there was no um, uh, things like um, standards and specifications. Everything available was for male condoms. And of course, FC1 then was for some of the testing and some of the trials. It was using male condom specifications and standards. Next slide, please. So what has changed since 1993? So, you know, it's over 20 years since female condoms became available. And so now the FDA is considering potentially declassifying some medical devices. So what have we got? We've got a body of data now for acceptability, functionality, some pregnancy and STI efficacy. We've got far uh, less data than we need for pregnancy, STI and HIV. Um, but we've got a lot of functionality data to show how new female condoms work in a pretty similar way. We've got a history of safety. Um, you know, over the years, there's been no reporting of serious adverse events, toxic shock, material allergies. And then also, over, especially in the last few years, we finally, finally got to the end of the road with the standards and specifications. So we now have um, guidance on trials. We now have the WHO, UNFPA, female condom generic specifications. And this is really important because this can guide manufacturers. And manufacturers have got exactly what they need uh, to know what they have to do, what test testing they have to do, what clinical trials they have to do, what their manufacturing specifications are. Next slide. So what would change if they were moved into class two? They would be treated in a similar way to male condoms, possibly require less clinical work if a design was considered similar to a currently approved design, but they would still have to adhere to the existing specifications and standards available. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mags. Um, we have a couple of questions, like I said, and people can keep um, sending these in, um, and that's fine. Um, one thing people wanted to, and this is more of just, I guess, like a conceptual question, um, but again, about the WHO pre-qualification. Um, our question asker was wondering, how does WHO pre-qualification help in product uptake? Help in product uptake. Um, well, it does. It does in a way because a product can't be purchased by donors, for instance. And in the female, the female condom market is quite different from the male condom market. It's almost entirely uh, purchased by donors. So there are a few large country programs. Um, really, it hasn't moved into the private sector. Um, that male condoms are in the private sector. People will go to chemists and find male condoms very difficult to find female condoms. So making um, some countries, for instance, may find that they, they can't um, tender for only one female condom. They may have to have at least two to tender for, and now there is two available. But um, I don't know, maybe someone else has, has a, a good answer for this, but I think it does improve uptake because it just gives a, a more variety of... Great, and actually we're just gonna oh, move on right system. now. There's many there's many male condom manufacturers. 
Great. Th thank you so much, Max. And actually, this is a nice segue um, into Saskia, uh, who's going to be speaking next pretty much to this issue. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, turn our presentation over to Saskia Huskin. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Saskia. Um, I hope you can all hear me very well. Um, I'll try to speak clearly, although I'm a bit far away. Um, I'm an advocacy officer with the Universal Access to Female Condoms joint program. And uh, just very briefly, one line of introduction on the program itself. Um, there's four founding members of this uh, joint program, which is iPlus Solutions, uh, Rutgers, where I am working with, Oxfam Novik, and the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And these four partners have been supporting this, uh, this joint program to work on making female condoms uh, available and accessible uh, at a global level and also uh, uh, at international level. And we have various uh, components that we work on, and I'm, I'm happy to, to, to tell you more about those, um, uh, but that may be a separate, uh, separate uh, presentation. Uh, today, I want to uh, just mention that we've been doing a lot of work together with um, Max Beksinska and her team from Match Research in South Africa, which includes work on the, on the clinical trials and the functionality studies that she mentions. So we really work hand in hand. And why is it so important? Um, well, we work on programming in country, in various countries, as well as uh, advocacy at various levels. We also work on um, market intelligence and system strengthening. And the question that was just asked uh, to Max, um, is that it's very important that um, female condoms are um, US FDA approved and hence we, we really support the, the advocacy for the, the down classification because um, the US FDA approval is one of the biggest um, um, stamps you can have on a product because that will allow uh, not only availability within the US government, uh, within the US, but also uh, purchase by USAID, which is internationally, um, besides UNFPA, uh, the biggest player in terms of procuring condoms for distribution in various countries. So as a country, we work in different countries, and at the moment we work in Cameroon, Nigeria, Mozambique, um, Nepal, and Bangladesh, and we have a um, work on female condom research and access and um, various people to talk to very often, and I, I suspect uh, some of you will be online for this webinar as well. Um, so what we want to focus on here is why um, that registration is so important and the different um, stamps, I call it stamps, it's like approvals that female condoms um, need to have. And um, I mentioned the USAID, being the, the biggest procurer for female condoms internationally, and they um, will only procure um, US FDA approved female condoms. So you can imagine for our program working at the country level, it's important that um, those condoms get, get actually out there. Um, then the, U, the WHO UNFPA pre-qualification status, which is also very important, both for USAID as well as for UNFPA, because first of all, quality is the most important thing when you work on, on barrier methods, but also um, uh, countries demand um, certain standards. And a way to map those standards uh, from what we've seen is um, they take the WHO essential medicines list as a model and uh, governments they um, it, it it allows them to to select and request uh, the purchase of the commodities that suit the needs of their populations so there's uh, essential medicines list at the WHO level as well as uh, national EMLs uh, essential medicines list and um, why that's important? It's uh, because there's um, uh, the, the, the quantification happens at, at national level often, and there's different layers of responsibility within the uh, national government. Uh, for example, uh, Nigeria or Mozambique, uh, they have national medical stores and provincial or state medical stores. 
and they all make their mapping, they, ma they quantify the number of products that they need. And if female condoms are not on, on the national essential medicines list, then different technical staff within those um, uh, government bodies will not recognize um, those commodities to be, to be needed. Um, so it's very important that female condoms are um, specified on the on both the WHO model list as well as the, the national model list, uh, the national EML, um, and not just condoms, because when you say condoms, people automatically think male condoms. So we've been, work we've been working uh, to spell out the details on what is needed for um, essential medicines list. Uh, we've written a, a piece on that, which, uh, which I'm happy to share or provide the link. Um, and then also to look at national EMLs on um, that, that uh, they don't just have um, brand names mentioned because that will then uh, limit their ability to switch to other two or more products for purchase. Um, then another point on, on the quantification in country, uh, what we've noticed is that um, the quantification of how many uh, female condoms a country would need. It, it depends on demand figures and on figures of consumption. And for female condoms, that's quite difficult because it's a um, two-pronged approach, looking at family planning, reproductive health services, and HIV prevention. So it actually fits under two ministries, under two strategies or more strategies. Um, and for example, UNFPA in country needs data to justify uh, their request for certain commodities. So that data is often lacking because people, um, they are not uh, demanding for female condoms. So that's how the circle is round again by saying, well, how can people ask for a commodity uh, when they've never heard of it? And how can governments say there's no demand for it when they don't um, make the products available to their populations? So that's a very big question mark, and we see it at every level of, of the work that we do, where there's a huge need for um, uh, demand generation activities, as well as in-country advocacy. So at the moment, we're working uh, with various partners in, in the countries I mentioned, as well as at global level, to share experiences on uh, demand generation as well as to look at um, advocacy organizations in country, how can they um, really dig into the, the documents and the, the, the policies available at national level, what is in their national EML uh, essential medicines list, are female condoms there, and how can we raise uh, more noise about female condoms, um, at least for people to try, and then they can always uh, decide whether they like it or not, but our principle as UFC is that we say every person, male and female, should have the choice of contraception and should be able to have access to, to, that, to that choice. And um, uh, I think that's one of the main, uh, main points that we're working at. And uh, just to round up, because I have a lot more to say, but I will stop here. Uh, just to round up is that uh, we have been putting a lot of um, our materials online uh, on our main website, uh, that's condomsforall.org, and then we have um, developed a female condoms market intelligence portal, which has been, um, uh, which has been developed by uh, our consortium partner iPlus Solutions, and the web address is uh, fcmi.org. So we will be soon launching a series of uh, short webinars on helping you uh, tr go through and navigate those, um, those portals. And there you'll have the most up-to-date information on all the products that uh, Max just described earlier and on the different manufacturers and on the different developments in, in this field at the global level. So uh, I'll hand it back to the organizers. Thank you for the opportunity to respond. Thank you so much, Saskia. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can type them in at this time. Um, we didn't have any um, specifically while Sagasia was talking, but again, if, there, if you have people have them, they can um, uh, chat them to us. And if we don't get to your question also during the webinar, we will follow up with you afterwards. All of our questions are logged. Um, so I think we can move on now. 
Um, I appreciate that. And we'll also, oh, just as a note, we can get the information about those webinars in our follow-up email as well. Those sound really interesting. So now we'll, I'm going to turn it over to Coco Jervis uh, from the National Women's Health Network. And um, she will talk a little bit about the, uh, the process of FDA approval of female condoms. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Coco Jervis. Um, I am the program director at the National Women's Health Network. The National Women's Health Network is a nonprofit advocacy organization based in D.C. that works to improve the sexual and reproductive health of all women. Uh, we bring the voices of women consumers to policy and regulatory decision-making bodies in the United States. And we were unique in that we're one of only a handful of health-focused nonprofits that do not take any financial contributions from drug companies or medical device manufacturers, insurance companies, or any other entities with a financial stake in women's health decision making. So my talk is going to pivot a little bit and talk more about the advocacy um, within the United States to get the female condom approved over the last 20 years um, and sort of um, starting our conversation about how we as um, organizations, individuals, and advocates can get involved with the current um, FDA declassification process. The network has been a member of the National Female Common Coalition for many years now. And I can say that after years of making small inroads, the coalition's advocacy is finally beginning to really pay off and accelerate. We're seeing a potential significant regulatory changes that will hopefully lessen some of the existing challenges with female condom procurement uptake in the U.S. that was previously mentioned. Uh, we know some very important facts that over 20 years of clinical data has shown that female condoms are safe and effective and, and comparable to male condoms. However, as we have already heard, outdated FDI, FDA guidelines currently categorize female condoms as a class 3 device. And it's categorized as a device used to quote unquote sustain or support life or device that presents a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. And as you all already know, we firmly believe that the FDA's class 3 designation is an overly stringent classification for female condoms that kind of discourages their wider availability and use. So for the past couple of years, we have been strategizing about the best way to get the FDA to consider reclassifying the female condom. And now we're finally beginning to see some encouraging momentum in this area. The Food and Drug Administration in the United States serves in part as a consumer watchdog agency that is tasked with safeguarding the public health from unsafe foods and drugs and medical devices. However, a component of the FDA's decision-making process needs to also come from the voices of women who are actually affected by their decisions. And as such, it's really critically important that the FDA hears from us, our experience as users of the female condom, advocates, community representatives, international community, and providers about the safety and efficacy of female condoms and the need to reduce regulatory and market access barriers that impede their wider um, availability and use. So just to contextualize this conversation, I think it's helpful to know some of the political history of how and why the freedom cost female condom got classified as a class three designation in the first place. Um, this is a slide one that we're currently on. Around 1987, a company called the Female Health Company, of course, was which was part of Wisconsin Pharmacal, developed the first female condom in the U.S. This condom, later named Real Teeth, was a lubricated or polyurethane pouch which was inserted to the vagina like a diaphragm, yet extended outside the body. It was marketed to investors of the company as a game changer in the late 1980s. It was, would be the first women-initiated barrier that could, if used consistently, consistently and correctly, protect the woman from FBI's even if their male partners refused to wear condoms. However, of course, before the female health company could make good market or introduce this new product into the U.S. market, they needed to get approval from the FDA, and that would prove to be a very difficult regulatory journey for them. It would take almost six years, as the female condom was an utterly new kind of product. Part of the reason why the female condom took so long to get a regulatory approval is because of the context of the time. It was during the late 1980s and early 1990s, the AIDS epidemic ravaged entire communities in the United States. There were no ARVs on the market and not much insight, and the AIDS community, particularly ACT UP, was organizing with protesting at the White House, at the Halls of Congress, NIH and FDA, and women's health advocates were at the forefront of this movement. 
And during this time also HIV and particularly the emergence of HIV and TB called epidemic really gripped the nation. So it was within this context that the female condom, an entirely new invention with no prior evidence demonstrating its effectiveness and safety for get, protecting against HIV, STIs, or pregnancy was considered. And uh, in fact, my own organization, the National Women's Health Network, we actually filed a citizen's petition, which is a petition by um, citizens to the FDA, in 1988, urging the agency not to approve of the first female condom because we argued it, it was not rigorously and sufficiently tested enough to prove that the make and the material and the whole concept which could prevent not only pregnancy but HIV, which at that time was a death sentence. So as such, we argued that women could not make an informed choice to protect their health, health if the FDA couldn't assure that female condoms work effectively. The FDA heard our arguments and agreed with us, and as such, they designated the new female condom as a class three device and demanded that the company go through clinical trials of the, of the device costing millions of dollars and, and many years. After the clinical trial studies were done, the female condom was eventually approved, despite some very troubling findings. The FDA at the time um, demanded that the product label note that the high pregnancy rate for those using the device as we found that during the study, about 26% of the users became pregnant within the first six months, a rate, of course, that was higher than that, than that for which the female barrier contraceptives were available at that time. That troubling finding suggested that the device was not that efficacious. However, looking back, we believe that that had more to do with clinical trial design and improper use of the female condom by study participants at the time. But ultimately, the National Women's Health Network with female condom advocacy was really critical for developing the foundational evidence base to support the use of female condoms. We prodded the FDA to require clinical trials in the first place. We educated FDA about the usefulness of a barrier device with less than perfect effectiveness. And we came to a consensus with the contraceptive development community contraceptive development community about a new FDA guidance for clinical trials for all barrier contraceptives. And all of these were important research advances for that time. Can you go to the second slide? So when the device was finally approved in the early to mid-1990s, its product launch did not go as expected. It was burdened by the poor efficacy results shown in the high pregnancy label. There was a, a label issue indicating that pregnancy rate. And also, um, people found that the device was not very intuitive and fam as familiar as a male condom. So it didn't really take off. Journalists mocked it, clinicians somewhat ignored it, and, and some women really shunned it, claiming that the condom was aesthetically unappealing and difficult to master. And, you know, it never really recovered from that bad initial press in the beginning. Of course, we have now seen through real-world data and experience that family, female condoms are just as efficacious as male condoms. They are more accepted by the general public and less risky. And a number of studies have shown and demonstrated that the protection offered by female condoms is comparable to that of male latex condoms in reducing unintended pregnancy and STIs. And so one of the reasons that we are continuing to push right now for declassifications is because of some of the continued obstacles posed by it currently being classed as a class three device. Part of that is the affordability and accessibility barrier um, in launching female condoms due to the high cost of having clinical trials for a new device that would not be substantially similar to the uh, condom that's currently in the market. So it's curtailed product in, in um, innovation. As we heard earlier, because USAID is the major procurer of female condoms and they have to be FDA approved, there is a huge impact on the ability for USAID to procure other, um, other types of condoms. There's a significant cost and delay associated with the regulatory challenges that are ultimately borne not only by the manufacturer but also in their by the customers. So um, female condoms have a higher cost in the United States than male condoms. Um, and there's also this issue about how the impact of the class three designation sort of inaccurately categorizes the safety and efficacy of the product, making it seem like it's more dangerous than it, than it is. And it really discourages the, the sort of wider consumer uptake and use. 
So moving forward, uh, 15 years, the same manufacturer, as you know, has innovated the female condom. The network, again, was involved in advocacy at the FDA to get the approval of the new version of the female condom, the FD2. Um, it was unanimously recommended for approval by the FDA in 2008, and at that time, the network submitted testimony and spoke out during the public comment se section of the meeting. We did a lot of press and had letters to the editors talking about it. Um, we really demanded that the FDA approve the FT2 because, we, as we testified, women around the world want and need the FT2 to expand their HIV prevention tools at their disposal. So during the FDA's committee's deliberations, and this is in the, in the official record, record several, advoc um, as, um, several of the committee members noted that the urgent concern articulated for the health of women around the world gave a vital public health significance to the agency's decision about the product. So I illustrate this as an example to show how the network's advocacy and the advocacy of women health advocates have really helped push the FDA to move the process along towards, you know, um, benefiting the female condom. And I think it's a good example of what we can do in the next two months to help move the process along to declassify the female condom to increase its uptake, accessibility, and the consumer confidence in the female condom in the U.S. market. And I'm going to turn to Jessica, who will talk a little bit more about this emerging avenue of advocacy and what we can do. Great. Thank you so much, Coco. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Trolikowski, and I'm with the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, and we're a founding um, founding partner and serve as the Secretariat of the National Female Condom Coalition. Um, so as Mags and Coco, you know, really explained how female condoms are currently classified, how that classif classification came about, um, and what are some of the consequences of a class three designation, I'm really going to dive into what down classification of female condoms is, why it's necessary, and how we can make it a reality um, through, through the advocacy and community mobilization efforts similar to, to the uh, points that Coco had made. So down classification is really much what it sounds like. It's moving the medical device from its current classification to one below it. For female condoms, we're, we're seeking to move from a class three to a class two, um, and there are a number of reasons to do this. Um, specifically, you know, the, the class three designation was given more than 20 years ago when the product was brand new and the data was limited. Um, as Coco and um, Mags have, have stated, this is really no longer the case. Um, and we really have an opportunity to introduce some of this new information that's now available um, to the FDA um, to help them see why there's a case for doing this down classification because we do, in fact, have ample data to demonstrate the safety and efficacy and, and the quality of female condoms. And then, of course, we also have this, this new um, the, the standardization that has been done um, in looking at the product guidance and definitions and, and clinical procedures that are required by industry and developers to ensure that there's, there's quality safeguards that, that are in place. Uh, next slide. So when we're talking about what the, the the case for down classification, we're really saying is that the reclassifying female condoms would achieve a number of ends. And I think, you know, first and foremost, what we're looking at is that the lower classification would, in fact, then mirror the latest scientific data. Um, the current classification, you know, as, as we've said, is those decisions were made decades ago um, and does not reflect the body of evidence that's now available regarding female condoms. Um, the work of MAGS and other researchers like her have really led this research, which has enabled this, this strong case for down classification. The other thing is that reclassifying FCs as a class two would align the FDA with other entities like the WHO, which also review female condom products um, and are doing so using the latest data and the agreed, uh, the agreed upon um, uh, international standards um, that have been been chat that have been talked about, those that the WHO are using to determine product prequalification. 
And I think perhaps most significant, significantly and why we as the National Female Condom Coalition and, and others are working to make down classification a reality is that making female condoms a class two device would make it easier and more affordable for manufacturers of other female condoms and other internal condoms to submit products for FDA review. As it currently stands, the data requirements for class three are really cost prohibitive for a number of manufacturers um, and are resulting in them not submitting their products for FDA review. Next slide. So ultimately what we're, what we're wanting to see is more than just a single product available in the U.S. Um, you know, Mags had shared a variety of different products that are available in a number of different countries and that we actually have new and exciting products that are also being developed by, by um, researchers and, and innovators. Um, and we want to make sure that we have more options for the diverse needs and desires for people in the U.S. Um, and, and really expand those, those choices for them so they find something that is going to meet their needs, um, meet their desires, and ultimately enable them to have safer, more pleasurable um, sex. And that's something that's really important. And one of the things that's important to note as well is that this isn't the down classification, and as, as Saskia mentioned, doesn't it just impact people in the U.S. The FDA approval of other female condoms would enable other would enable U.S. funded foreign aid programs to purchase and program these other products as well. So, we would help to advance to expand the number of options that women and men across the globe are are able to choose from. We know that not that the FC2 is not the product for everybody, and that's really okay. Um, but we want to make sure that we're expanding the array of options that people have to choose from. Next slide. So the, the, the National Female Condom Coalition actually began exploring the down classification strategy in 2013. Um, and, you know, in, in conversations with folks um, with the National Women's Health Network in particular, and I definitely want to give a lot, of, um, a lot of love to our friends at the network um, who have been really integral in, in helping um, female condom advocates get up to speed on the, the, the regulatory advocacy processes and where there's opportunities for us to have some influence, um, which has been really important for us. Um, and we learned and really, you know, decided as, as a group and through conversations with other partners, including PATH and MATCH and others, that there's an opportunity to really make, make down, down classification a reality. Um, and we had decided that in, in, in mid-2014. So many of you likely saw that we led a letter urging the down classification um, in February. Um, it turns out that we're actually at a very opportune time to reclassify female condoms. So not, not only do we as advocates and researchers have the data and the quality standards on our side, we actually have a unique opportunity within the FDA's own processes to have some influence. So the FDA is the FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health, which oversees this classification, is in the process currently of reviewing their the the um, body of class three products to assess whether a change in classification is warranted for a number of different products. Um, so we actually received really good news in April um, when the FDA um, Center for Devices and Radiological Health announced that female condoms are in fact candidates for reclassification. This is a really important step. It is a first step, but it is a very important one. Um, and this is enabling us to, to, to move forward um, in our effort to, to down classify as the environment is really, um, is really, is really fertile for it. Um, so the, the FDA has actually issued a request for public comments regarding reclassification um, and those opportunities, there's an opportunity for advocates and researchers and organizations and individual consumers to weigh in um, by June 29th. Next slide. So we're actually at the at the National Female Condom Coalition are doing some a significant amount of organizing around this. 
we're, and we're hoping that you will join us in our effort. We are going to be, we're in the process of finalizing comments that will go to the FDA. Um, and there's going to be a form that will be available on the website. Um, and organizations uh, will have the opportunity to sign on as endorsers. We're actually going to be circulating that request starting tom tomorrow. Um, and there's also going to be an opportunity for organizations to submit their own comments. And we encourage, encourage organizations to do that. Uh, we will provide a, 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 mod a template that organizations are able to modify and tailor to really represent the voices of the constituents that they represent, um, and then to submit those comments to the FDA on their own. Um, and then finally, we are launching a grassroots effort that's going to be starting in earnest um, in July, um, in which we've got a petition campaign that's focused on the FDA, where we're going to be collecting um, messages from individuals across the country um, to submit uh, to the FDA and to deliver those on Global Female Condom Day, which is September 16th. Um, there's going to be a number of communications coming out about this. Um, the, the, the comments uh, opportunities will be coming out, as I said, by the end of the week, and then the grassroots piece will be, will be launching in July. So please do keep an eye out for that, um, and we really uh, invite you to, to join us in those efforts and to get involved in person and online um, and to engage your own individual um, professional um, and, and organizing networks in that effort as, as well. Next slide. So I want to make a, a quick plug for another way for, for folks to get involved with female condom advocacy, and that's Global Female Condom Day, um, which is an annual day of action that is hosted on, um, on, on September 16th um, and is led by National Female Condom Coalition, um, UAFC, PATH, and the Center for Health and Gender Equity. Um, and we're really excited to, to have uh, more information coming about this in the, in the coming weeks. Um, there's a number of resources and tools that are available on the website that we've developed just for the Global Female Condom Day, which is femalecondomday.org. Um, and you know, we encourage you to, to check those out um, and to, to connect the advocacy around Global Female Condom Day to our efforts around uh, down classification of, of female condoms. Great. Thanks, Jessica. And um, we just have a, a little bit more information about um, actually a female condom conference that's coming up um, that Mags might be able to give us a little more detail on. Yeah, thanks. Um, just to a reminder, if, if people haven't heard about the um, Global Female Condom Conference, it's uh, going to be this year from the 1st to 3rd of December. Um, if you can go on to the next slide. If you go on to the websites of any of the four organi organizing um, partners, that's UAFC, Match Research, PSI, or Change, there's a registration form. It's going to be an exciting conference. There's um, going to be an advocacy track, um, scientific track, and program track. So um, it's a very low registration cost. You can't see it very well, but it's $170. Um, and there's the abstracts will be, um, sessions will be open for submission um, in a couple of weeks. So please do think about coming. Um, I know that HIV prevention, there's generally conferences, but they don't really include the female condom or the male condom. So we felt it was quite important to have a, a conference of our own. So um, hopefully um, you'll be at, people will think about coming to Durban in December this year. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Um, and uh, with that, so people can um, ask any questions they have about the last two pre well, anything, but especially if you have anything um, to say about um, Coco or Jessica's presentation or questions about that, um, feel free to type them in. Um, we've had a lot of comments come in um, through the question feature and the chat feature um, with people um, just kind of voicing that, we, that there is the need for advocacy to sort of raise up female condoms, that they're still all over the world, especially people have mentioned India and other countries um, not really seen as equal to male condoms or as valid as male condoms. So I think, again, with this FDA um, campaign that we are running, that we will be able to kind of lift up 
um, the importance of female condoms and why they are such a needed resource. Um, and I, we did get a couple of questions um, previously and about the origami condom. I know that Mags, you had said um, that we don't have a ton of information on it. Um, and so I don't know if anyone would be able to answer these questions, anyone on the panel. Um, but people were curious about um, if they're, they'd like to know if, again, just to re-clarify, that the origami internal condom, has it replaced the female condom design? Do we know about that? Or has, has it it's, changed it's, because um, originally? It's, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. If the, the origami female condom design is, is just renamed as an internal condom because it can be used for either anal or vaginal sex. So okay. I think that there is an issue about naming of the female condom because it is the FC2, for instance, is commonly used for anal sex with the ring removed. Um, but there is a barrier with the name, you know, using the name female condom. So I think they've moved towards using the, uh, the term internal condom. Got it. Thanks very much for that clarification. Um, and like I said, I think that we, I said there were, and if we did not get to your question, if anyone has another question, um, we can um, follow up after the, um, after the webinar. But we do have a, a few more minutes if you want to type in and send your questions. Um, I do actually, and one has just come in, um, so I'm going to read that to our panel now. And so do we have any idea um, regarding how soon we can expect a decision from the FDA um, in terms of reclassification after the comment deadline has passed. Um, just as a reminder, say we're going to submit our comments and we encourage people to sub submit comments by June 29th. And do we know kind of what will happen after that? And this is for anyone on the panel. Yeah, so thanks for that. It's a, it's a good and important question and the short answer is that we, we, don't, have a, we don't have a timeline for that right now. Um, it's one of the things that we're we're urging that the decision be made we ma be made quickly. And I don't know if Coco, you have any other sort of <laughs> thoughts about that. No, since but, but, but to underscore what you say, uh, you know, the FDA is very responsive to to pressure that comes from consumers and, and advocates. And so, as much as we can stress that they need to, you know, accelerate the process from which they come to a decision, um, particularly before the end of this administration. So hopefully by the end of 2015, but if not early 2016, um, we need to, to emphasize that and, and, and let them know that we're paying attention and that we're expecting them to, to resolve this quickly. Great. Thank you. Um, and here's a, I wish I got another question that come in, and this is a bit more back to just sort of the class of current classification um, of, of female condoms. And if we have any information about what are the quote unquote unreasonable risks associated with female condoms that have landed them in the class three. Is that a simply a lack of data or does it imply that we need, there's more investment that we need um, in terms of research safety um, and efficacy of female condoms? Yeah. This is Coco, I can answer that. At the time when it was first um, going up for FDA approval in the late 1980s, there wasn't any previous data or information about the efficacy of safe or safety. And you know, as I mentioned, just during the first trial, there were some issues related to um, the high pregnancy rate and the usability and all. so I think that over the last twenty years, a lot of these safety and efficacy questions have been answered. Um, the it product has improved. And so now it's sort of the categorization of the device as being unreasonably safe does not actually um, relate to, to the, the actual um, reality of the product, which is why we are seeking a reclassification. And I think the FDA is, has acknowledged as much. So, mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. That, yeah, that's good. And like, thank you for, again, kind of mentioning that context. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. I just did also want to open it up to the panel, though, if anyone had some final or closing comments, um, either Mag, Jessica, or Coco. No, I don't think so. No, but I urge people to get involved with the National Female Condom Coalition's advocacy and work. There's a lot of things that are going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks, and so please stay engaged. Indeed, yeah, I think that's sort of the 
the biggest thing, and that there's going to be ways for folks of sort of all levels of capacity that you have within your organization or as an individual to support this effort. Um, so please do stay tuned, um, and that will be coming coming out very soon. Yeah, and again, just just to again echo that that um, yes, that we will have opportunities as Jessica mentioned for like individuals, organizations, um, whatever level you're at, um, to get involved. Um, we will be following up this week with um, the slides for this webinar, um, the recording of this webinar, and also more information, again, that online petition, um, and more information about um, how you can submit comments or your organization can endorse our comments. So again, in here, just on the screen, is ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, and just want to, again, say thank you to all of the organizations that helped to sponsor this webinar, and also to our great panel for providing um, so much rich information and kind of giving us the background and then also the way forward. So thank you again to everyone. And like I said, we will definitely be in touch um, throughout the summer with more ways you can get involved. So thank you. Thank you.